it's been interesting for me to watch the evolution of the course over the past uh, 38, I was introduced to the course uh, by Dr. Helen Shookman, and it was interesting where I was introduced to the course, because we're about as close as you can get in, in being near where Helen lived on East 17th Street, and we're between 12th and 13th Street here in New York City. So actually, one of the previous workshops I did here, one of the ladies insisted afterwards that I take her and show her the apartment building <laughs> that Helen lived in. So I took her over so she could see the apartment building. Not that we're not going to we're not going to make any tours over there. <laughs> it was very near, and also Ken too. Ken Watnick uh, got an apartment directly, almost kind of kind of catty corner across from where Helen lived, so that it would make it convenient for the two of them to to spend time working together. So, <clears throat> let's dive into this. Now, some of what I'm about to say, for, the, for that first group of people who held your hands up, some of this may seem a little repetitious to you, you may go, I already know that. But you also know that one of the most important parts of the course concerns forgiveness. So that means it'll be easy for you to forgive me. <laughs> I, yeah. Say something that you already know. Right? So, this is a course in miracles. First line, it's a required course. So we're going to go line by line. <laughs> what it means when it says it's a required course is that at one point or another, each and every one of us, psychologically speaking, We'll go through the same process that the Course is talking about as a part of our waking up and as a part of our remembering God again. Now, one of the things that I love about the Course, and I'm sure that you do too, especially if you're a serious student of the Course, uh, is that the Course says of itself that this is a way, not the way. So it says, as a matter of fact, there are many thousands of different pathways back to God. Again. And actually, if you think about it, they're better because there are as many pathways as there are people on this planet. We are all really looking to get back to God again, or to put it more in, in also in course, and we're looking really to wake up and to remember the truth of the identity of who we, of who we are, not as separated, isolated individuals, seemingly almost trapped inside of bodies but a part of oneness, a part of wholeness, a part of the kingdom of heaven, which has always been there and we're actually all already part of it. But using Course in Miracles terminology, we're, we're sleeping. We're, we're, we're dreaming this dream of individuality, we're dreaming this dream of separation, and it looks very real. It's, it's kind of hard to, the Course says at one point, <clears throat> it's very hard to deny the seeming reality of the body. Although one of the most important points in the whole course is, and what the, the sentence was to be repeated more than any other is, uh, I am not a body. <laughs> I am free. I am still as God created me. So, and you are not a body. Uh, and the fact is, I love it when you come across a line in the course and you, after you read the line you go, what? <laughs> Here's one of those what's. Not for a single instant does the body exist at all. What? Not for a single instant does it exist at all? That's because it's a dream figure. It's a figure, and there's a very simple proof of it. And there's a very simple proof of it is that at some point it will disappear. All bodies, in case you have not noticed, uh, disappear. <laughs> uh, they turn back into the earth, or they turn into ashes, uh, and they literally disappear because that has absolutely nothing to do with who you are, the truth of the reality of who you are, which is spirit, or mind is another word, which is uh, nothing which is physical. We have to talk a lot as we go on about the difference between form and formlessness. It's hard for us to try to imagine what formlessness means, and that the truth of the matter is that that's the only thing which is real. The mind does not actually have a form, it's a part of the mind. Right? We'll come back to that. A little history, <clears throat> a little bit of background to how the whole course came into existence. And some of you I know know this part. 
so it started uh, actually in June of 1965 when Dr. William Thedrick, who was head of the part of Department of Psychology at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons here in New York City, turned to his assistant, Dr. Helen Shookman, and said to her, there's got to be another way. Meaning, <clears throat> there's got to be some way that us human beings can get along with each other. Without all this fighting and backbiting and one on the and game playing, that probably characterizes not only every college and university and hospital and fire department and police department and office and family in the world. And Helen turned back to Bill and said, you're right. A moment of sanity prevailed in Helen's mind. And she said, you're right. I will help you find it. That was the first miracle. The first miracle was that Helen agreed to help somebody. <laughs> As you all know, I knew Helen, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. But a little bit more about Helen and Bill. That was in June of 65. Uh, in October 1965, just as we say, four blocks from where we are right now, Helen is scribing in her notepad. Helen was subject to very vivid dreams. She also had lots of very vivid, kind of visionary kinds of experiences. Um, it's interesting because she also identifies herself as being an atheist. And I'm sure that that's true. Uh, certainly on an intellectual level, uh, that's, you know, that's, that was true for her as well. She was a young intellectual here in New York City. Uh, Helen went back and got her doctorate, it, it also right down the street here at New York University, um, when she was already in her 40s, right? and <clears throat> never made anything less than A. So she was this genius, and she was also married to a genius. Uh, her husband, Louis, was a genius. He owned a, an, an unprofitable bookstore uh, here in New York City. Um, but that was his love was books, so uh, that's what they, that, that, how they tried to make a living. Although Helen actually came from a fairly wealthy family. A little bit about that. She grew up in a family where her father <coughs> was uh, half Jewish, half Lutheran, but preferred to th think of himself as being a militant atheist. So if you're a militant atheist, that means you've got some kind of dynamic going on with God. And her mother looked into theosophy and religious science and uh, unity and Christian science, and probably more than anything was influenced by Christian science, but she did not adopt any particular religious persuasion either. You can see there's a very really interesting connection between religious science and the Course in, in Miracles. Uh, or, or, I meant to say Christian science, Christian science, because of the, the strong emphasis that they both play upon the power of the mind and upon our ability to make choices. This is a very, very important point in the course in terms of our ability to choose uh, whether we're gonna go with what the course calls right-minded or wrong-minded, whether we're gonna go with the ego or whether we're gonna go with the Holy Spirit and our decision-making and then the kind of results that we get in the world. It's actually, what the course is, it's a course in mind training. And, and it says of itself uh, that it says of us, and this was really directed specifically to Helen in this following line, uh, you have been very poorly taught, <laughs> not in terms of intellectual, but in terms of the world, right? And you're very tolerant of mind wandering, and you passively condone your mind's miscreations, right? So that's really meant for all of us. It was meant for Helen, but it was really meant for, for all of us. So one of the things that Bill <coughs> did with Helen was he encouraged her to write down these visionary experiences that she was having, to write down the, these, some of these dreams that she was having because they were so incredibly vivid and they seemed to be saying something very important. So one evening in October of 1965, that event in, in June, it's now October, Helen is in the process of writing down 
a description of her dream vision, a very fine line between dream and vision. The basic difference is when you're dreaming, your eyes are closed and you're unconscious, and the visionary state is your, your eyes may be open or closed, but you're, you're awake rather than uh, being unconscious at the time that it happens. But it all seems to be coming from another source, even though it's really our projections, but we project what we see. In any event, uh, in the middle of this writing came the line, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. And Helen did. She took notes actually for the next almost seven years. The course started in October of 65 and ended in uh, September of 72. And as you know, so that's seven years. It, there are three books. We have a textbook of 669 pages. We have a workbook of 365 lessons, so there's at least one lesson a day. And then we have a manual for teachers of 92 pages. So all total we're looking at, actually that's 486,365 words. And then if we add the two pamphlets, which would include psychotherapy, purpose, process, and practice, and the Song of Prayer, we're looking at over 500,000 words. So half a million words, which constitutes the course. Uh, the course was published on June um, 22nd, 1976. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a little party uh, at the day it was published uh, at Judy Scotch. Judy Scotch, her name is now Judy Whitson. At that point, it was Judy Scotch. We had a party at Judy's uh, apartment uh, on 81st Street and uh, Central Park West and the Ferris Street up on the fifth floor, and the books were all laid out for each of us to be able to take copies of. Although there was a group of us that started working with the course when it was still in manuscript format. Let me just share with you briefly how I got involved. Um, what happened was that actually 40 years ago, um, I was giving a talk in Chicago. I just came back from giving a talk in Chicago at a hotel at a conference. And um, this was sponsored by an organization called Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship. Anybody remember? I guess it's been kind of dead long enough that uh, most people have done. Every once in a while I remember somebody, meet somebody that doesn't remember it. So Spiritual Frontiers was sponsoring this conference. And uh, I was one of the speakers. I had just had a book come out called Learning to Die, which I think may be the title of my last book, too. Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, uh, Hugh Lynn Casey, who was Edgar Casey's son, was the keynote speaker at this particular conference. I actually remember sitting next to him when we were being introduced on the stage, and then again at dinner. And after the course was done, even before the course was done, Helen and Bill spent some time looking into things that came in a similar way to the course. Because let's be really clear, Helen did not write the Course in Miracles. I'll talk more about that in a little bit too. But she, there's no doubt about the fact that it, it, she, it was given to the right person. I'll explain why it was given to the right person, but she did not she regarded Helen as the scribe, of course. Her name did not appear on the original edition. It wasn't uh, even added <clears throat> until the second edition, uh, which wasn't until 1992, so it was a long time. After Helen, Helen died on February the 9th, uh, 1981. <coughs> and uh, just a, there's just a little thing that's kind of interesting about Helen's funeral. Um, Helen described herself, she wrote a description that was added to the second edition of herself. And that was, she wrote this in 1977. And in that, she described herself as an atheist, right? In theory, right? Uh, Dr. Ken Walnick uh, gave um, Helen's eulogy. It was about a half hour long. I was there, and I remember what impressed me about that he devoted the entirety of that half hour talking about Helen's devotion to God. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an interesting eulogy for, for an atheist, right? To spend the entire time 
talking about their devotion to God. And when I say devotion to God, I just mean that Helen did what she was asked to do. One of the things that I really admired about Helen was the way she kept herself out of the limelight when it came to the course. Uh, she would not appear on stage, uh, she would not do TV interviews, she would not do radio interviews, she would not do public uh, presentations. In very small groups, yeah, she would sit in someone's living room with a small group of people and talk about the course, and, 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 or at, at Judy's place, or some other places as well, but never, that job really fell to, uh, to Ken Wapnick or anybody else and to Judy uh, Whitson, and to, uh, of course, to Bill, somewhat, although Bill also kind of, kind of stood back a little bit. But the interesting thing that happened, uh, history-wise, the first conference that was ever held on the course was held here in New York City on May 13th, we're pretty close to that date, aren't we? May 13th, uh, 1978. So that means it was about a month less than two years after it had been released. And uh, there were over 300 people attended that conference at the Barbizon Plaza. And um, of course, Judy was there, and Ken was there, and Bill was there, and Jerry Jampolsky was there, and I was there, and Helen was not there. And there was a really good reason why Helen wasn't there. And there's a couple of reasons, actually, why Helen wasn't there. One of the reasons that she wasn't there is that there was someone whose name will not be mentioned, and not that anyone would remember after all these years, I don't think, but just in case, there's no reason to, to say, uh, that she didn't like. <laughs> it was one of the teachers of the course. <clears throat> And she thought that this fellow was uh, misinterpreting her baby, mixing the wage stuff in with it. And uh, there was no way that she was going to sit and listen to this guy talk about abuse of her baby. Right? So that's one reason. The other reason she wasn't there is there were enough of us who knew who she was that we would have approached her. And um, other people would have seen us approach. She did not want to get people gathering around her. She did not. She wouldn't like that. She wouldn't like people gathering around her. Uh, Helen never made any money off of the course. Uh, she didn't need to, but she also just never did. It wasn't That wasn't what it was all about. It was just about doing what she was asked to do, and she did what she was asked to do uh, very faithfully. You all probably know some stories about Helen, and that uh, Helen was, a, in a sense, kind of two people. We all are. <laughs> We're all split. <laughs> Uh, by that, I mean, on the one hand, uh, my only relationship with her was uh, when she was on her very loving side. Uh, I really only got to know that part of Helen. I knew from Judy and Ken and others that she had a very contrary side, a very judgmental side, uh, and she could kind of just let that side go as well. Uh, but. That, I never experienced it, but I knew that it, I knew that it happened. Right? So the time that I spent with Helen was either spent um, in counseling, she, she sort of became like my therapist uh, from during the last five years of her life, uh, or in a social mode, like uh, at parties. Uh, she drafted me at one point to perform a wedding ceremony for a couple of friends of hers, which was held up in uh, Westchester, and, and I did that, but that was a very, that was a very fun time. You know, that was a, that we were out on a beautiful day at a, at a wedding, so that was a very different sort of situation. So back to Chicago. So I'm in Chicago giving this talk, and um, Helen and Bill came to my lecture. They were actually there to see Hugh Lynn Casey, I think more than they were to see me, and to talk to Hugh Lynn. Uh, but they came to my, the talk that I was giving on mysticism. And then I was introduced to the two of them um, later that evening in someone's home. And um, <laughs> I actually, uh, I don't think they said A Course in Miracles. I think they said that Helen had written like an inspirational book. And that's as best as I can remember. And um, 
I had just had a book come out. So, <laughs> a little, little tiny book, about a 100 page book or so, or 125 pages. And I actually remember looking at Helen. Helen's this short little woman with frizzy hair and big glasses. And, you know, kind of thinking, isn't that sweet? The little old lady with an inspirational book. <laughs> I bet it's got some nice prayers in it. It does. It has some very nice prayers. As in fact, is, uh, if you've got the handout that was coming in, uh, on the back of my business card, there's a prayer, which is uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. And when we end the end of the day today, I'm going to ask that we all read that out loud together. But we'll give, that'll be the last thing that we'll do today. I'll give you the instruction. Okay. So uh, that was our first meeting. <clears throat> and then in 74, I wrote a letter which got published in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology expressing interest in being in contact with people who were working in the fields of psychotherapy and spirituality. And Bill saw my letter and told Helen that he thought it was a call for her to complete the writing of the psychotherapy pamphlet. So you know, the psychotherapy pamphlet came the same way that, that the course did. Uh, Helen remembered our meeting, uh, called me in April, essentially April of 19. 75 and says I have something for you and I said okay and she said well, could we have a meeting so I agreed to go meet her and Ken and Bill and a priest whose name is Father Benedict Rochelle who's still around but no longer involved with the course at all and we met on in Ken's little tiny studio apartment over here on 17th Street. Um, I was living at the time inside of General Theological Seminary, which some of you may know is between uh, 20 and 21 on the on the west side. If you've never been inside there, you should go inside. It's really beautiful. I like this most incredible little garden. It's a huge garden actually here. They have a whole block in New York City, but you can't see it in the right place. Um, so I walked over, Helen sat on Ken's daybed, and I remember thinking about it, it was sort of interesting, it's been interesting watching Ken's evolution over the past uh, 40 years. Uh, there was nothing in the apartment. <laughs> what I mean by nothing, I mean, I remember going into the bathroom and noticing there was a towel and a toothbrush. <laughs> and in the kitchen there was a pot uh, for water and there was, uh, no, there were no whatnots, no electronics, you know, I don't remember anything like that, you know, no, no knickknacks or TVs or, you know, there was just this uh, typewriter and these big black binders were sitting on the floor uh, next to a table and um, Ken was kind of, he was going to become a monk, and he sort of had a monk, monkish mind, I mean, that in the sense of, you know, uh, he was very dedicated. It's been amazing to watch Ken over the last uh, 40 years because of his incredible focus. And I wrote a, an article on Ken in 1970, 1991 called Impeccably on the Path, and he has been impeccably on the path. Uh, all along the way, never, ever. He's been a wonderful kind of older brother to me uh, throughout this entire time. So Helen sat on Ken's daybed, um, told me about the course, how it came into existence, how it affected the ones who were there in the room, and then gave me the manuscript of the psychotherapy pamphlet. So I walked home that night, back over to General Theological, carrying that manuscript under my arm, thinking that probably the most important thing which had ever happened to me, it just had happened, but I had no idea what it was. And I would say it was over a year before I began to understand the course. The next event which occurred was that uh, about six weeks after that, um, Helen met Judy Woodson. And when Judy and I had been friends, uh, for a while already, since the 60s. Uh, we both were teaching uh, in the uh, department over at NYU, the Extended Education Department, right? 
and uh, we were both active in the parapsychological movement here in New York City, uh, the American Society for Psychical Research. Uh, we were both very active there, and I was actually dating the lady who was the secretary to the president of the American Society for Psychical Research, which was Judy, one of Judy's best friends. She, Judy had several best friends, right? So it was all kind of, Judy was always having people over, come over, come, come over, I want you to come over and watch Ray Geller Ben Spoons. Watch Ray Geller Ben Come over and see the latest in curling photography. And we go, we go look at the latest. So she was always into whatever, whatever the most exciting development was in, in psychical research. So when Judy got the course, she just really took part with it, like this has been the thing she'd been looking for all of her life. And finally, here it was. And one of the first things that she saw through that, that got done was through the assistance of a friend of hers uh, named Criswell, a psychologist in California. They saw to it that 300 copies of the course were Xeroxed. So we started working with Xerox copies. I still have a couple of sets of these Xerox copies. Right. So that's sort of the evolution. Um, as I said, it was published on June 22, 76. There's, again, an interesting little parallel with uh, Christian science. The interesting parallel with Christian science is that Mary Becky Baker Eddy's Science and Health was copyrighted in 1875 and published in uh, 1876. The course was copyrighted in 1975 and published in 19. 76, and of course if you think back to 1776, there was another really important document about freedom, right, about liberation, and the course is about freedom and liberation too, because this is freedom and liberation of the mind, whereas that was about more about freedom and liberation of our, our bodies. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in 2076? <laughs> So it's just sort of this very nice kind of evolutionary process. So the course passed the million mark in sales in 1992. Uh, it currently stands, I think, at around 2.3 million in sales. Uh, it exists in 23 different languages now. It's growing faster in sales uh, after English, of course. The next is Spanish, which probably shouldn't surprise any of us. Uh, then I think the next uh, is Chinese and uh, and uh, German, and I think Portuguese. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, it's happening in Japan, of course, as well. And, and they're getting more excited about that there. Uh, my book is in five languages. The sixth, actually, the sixth, but the sixth one is now. And the sixth one is uh, Korean. So uh, it's happening in the East. The course, as you know, is very similar to Eastern philosophy. Uh, it's sort of, uh, Bill called the course the Christian Vedanta, uh, which it really is because it's, it's Christian in context, but um, unlike Christianity, which is basically a dualistic system, Christianity posits the existence of heaven, but it also posits the existence of hell and the devil, and the minute we do that, we're in trouble, uh, whereas the Eastern philosophy uh, is, talks about that there's only one, right? There's only one mind, there's only one possibility. We can't have split. We only have to have unity. Now a little bit about the course itself. Um, one of the things that I've noticed happens with the course, and I'm sure this has been true for many of you, is that you start reading it and you go, who wrote this? <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty clear pretty quickly that no body wrote it, right? Uh, that the, the source is, uh, is a divine source. Uh, actually, as we all know, Jesus wrote it uh, through Helen. Um, I think it's interesting how with inspired literature, that the best stuff that we have uh, Usually the person who writes it will say they didn't write it. Um, St. Bridget um, of Sweden said that she did not write her book, that it was given to her in a flash, right? 
just like that, it was instantaneously given to her. Um, that would also have been true for Jacob Boma and Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, Mozart said that he did not write uh, his sonatas, that they were given to him. But one of the things that's interesting about Mozart is that Mozart knew how to write music. So that would be an important prerequisite to, to writing music, is you have to know how to write music. Right? Uh, some of you may know the story of Ramanujan, I don't know whether you do or not, but it's a very interesting story. There's a fellow named Raman Ramanujan who was born in the 1880s, died in 1920. He was only like 32, 33 years old when he died. Uh, who was an Indian uh, mathematic genius who came up with 3,900 theorems in the course of his lifetime. He sent a bunch of these off to uh, some professors at Oxford University, and I'm talking about early, early 1900s, right? And uh, two of the professors just poo-pooed it so it didn't even make sense to them. A third one says, no, he thought there was something valid in these. He couldn't disprove any of the theorems that this guy had come up with. Um, so they invited him to come to Oxford. They were thinking they were going to make him a, a fellow at Oxford. But it turned out he was kind of an idiot savant. By an idiot savant, I mean, as it turned out, he could only think in math. He had a mathematical mind model. He could only, th it would be like he could only think in math. You know, it's kind of like the, you know, the beautiful mind story from several years ago, right? Well, so they couldn't give him a position because he, uh, he, he wasn't interested in history. He didn't care about <laughs> sociology, that, that kind of stuff. You know, this, he got only think in math. And none of his theorems, I think, have ever been disproved. And uh, a lot of them have to do with subatomic physics, which didn't even exist. I mean, you know, Einstein was about the same time coming up with his, his theories, right? So, but Ramanujan said that he did not come up with, these were all given to him. They were gifts that were given to him. But he knew how to write math, right? Uh, a more contemporary, uh, illustration of this, which many of you may know, is Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which I'm sure many of you can remember, Jonathan Livingston Seagull was um, not only the best-selling book for the night, it was, came out in 1970, and for the first several years thereafter, it was right at the top of the list. Um, he claimed that he did not write that book, that it was given to him. Now, Richard Bach, uh, who's still alive, uh, is a stunt air pilot and uh, aviator. And if you read Jonathan, I just reread it this last summer, just for fun, it is filled with very intricate descriptions of very complicated aerobotic moves. <laughs> but you know, he twists it, the wings this way and he does it that way. So he knew how to describe these really complicated aerobotic that, that only a stunt pilot would really been able to have described that this seagull is doing. And then he wrote two other books after that, one called Illusions, which a lot of people really, really like uh, a lot as well. So it's a gift. Ed Edgar Casey is another example of someone that Bill and Helen were looking into <coughs> that work, and um, he said that this was just a gift to him. Now, it took a long longer to go through some of that history than I thought it was going to. So let me move on and start talking about just a very quick uh, overview of what the Course is saying, okay? So, the Course is a radical philosophy. Uh, when I say radical, uh, the word radical means root, like a radish, right? So it's going to take us back down to the root of the root of the root of the cause of our dysfunction in the mind, and it's going to help us try to fix it back down at the, at the root level, to really help us to, to understand how we need to change our minds. The Course is written on two different levels. 
Uh, although it never says that in the book, but it's really written on two different levels. Uh, the two different levels are that the, the top level is what we call the metaphysical level, uh, where we're talking about God and heaven and truth and reality and words which are so big that we can't provide definitions for them. Uh, but really that's the thing which is running the whole show in reality. Uh, and then on the more practical, mundane, everyday level, let's, one example of the difference between the metaphysical level and the practical level would be with the word God. But by the way, the two words in the Course in Miracles that are very important, we should try to define up front. And you can't define them. <laughs> so when I say you can't define them, but let's, let's talk about what we can't define. There are two little words that start with, they both have the word go in them. Uh, there are only three letters each, and of course you know what they are. Uh, the first one is G-O-D, the first one starts with go, and we can't define God. And the reason we can't define God, of course, very simply, is that God is just way beyond definition. God is so far, you know, words, of course, says there's symbols of symbols twice removed from reality, so how are you going to put into words a description of something that doesn't fit into words? You really can't do it. So, God is defined at one point in the course, he says you can't define God, but one of the, this is the divine abstraction, that's the phrase, divine abstraction takes joy in sharing, which we said earlier. So, but what is divine abstraction? You know, it's, it's right, but it, it's abstract. When, when we say abstract, it means actually that it's formless. It doesn't have a form. Um, but it is something which we may experience. Because one of the basic definitions, actually, that every one of the world's religions has for God, everyone, says that God is love. Okay, what's love? Well, on the very first page of A Course in Miracles, The Imperfection, it says that love is beyond description. <laughs> so we can't define this thing. And yet, um, we all know there is something called love. <coughs> is there anybody here who thinks there's no such thing as love? Okay, so we got 100% agreement. There's something called love, and we, we can't define it. But we all know that it's true, and the way that we all know that it's true is because we experience it. It's an experience. And not only is it an experience, but it's an incredible experience. It's, it's the deepest experience that we human beings can have. Right? So, and we, we fall in love, and it's the most beautiful experience we can have. Whether that's the, the love that we have for the romantic sense, or uh, my wife said that uh, the moment our daughter was adopted, that the moment that she was put into her arms and she looked into the, her eyes, she fell in love. All right, she was just she fell in love, but right then and there. And the reason for that is that uh, it's the innocence. We see the, the innocence right in, in the child. And um, I know when I first fell in love with my high school sweetheart, and then many years later when I fell in love with my wife, the, the, the thing which pulled me in was the, in, I saw the innocence, the innocence there. You could see the innocence, and you just, <laughs> innocence will get you every time. And, and the Course is trying to get us back there. That's one of the reasons we, we, we play so much importance over the, the birth of Jesus as a baby. You know, it's, it's really going back to looking at the, the immaculate nature, right? The immaculate nature, I mean the pure nature, the innocent nature. Now, that's got turned into mythology by traditional Christianity, but there still is a, something behind all that, right? So, so God, it can be defined. Now, at the same time we can define God, the Course uses uh, practical words to describe God. Like, <clears throat> one of the most practical words he uses calls God's Father. Okay, so, Father is uh, an image that we can all relate to and we can all understand. One of the best, probably the most important, I think, parable of Jesus in the Gospels is the story of the prodigal son, <clears throat> which is all about a father who is very clearly God in relationship to his son, his child, and at another point, not today, because it would take us uh, too long, I'll talk about the, the prodigal son parable story. It's a wonderful story, 
for us to understand our relationship with God, because we're all prodigal sons and daughters. We're all, uh, we've all said, uh, I'd like to have my inheritance, please, and I'm gonna go off and have time. I'm gonna do it my way. <laughs> That's the theme song of the ego. The theme song of the ego is I'll do it my way. And the father says, okay, you know, here it is, you, you're given a certain number of talents and treasures, and, and uh, go see what you, and inevitably though, we, we come to have some sort of crash and burning experience and realize that uh, it's interesting in the prodigal son story when the prodigal son crashes and burns the line is <clears throat> and when he came to himself and I think we can use a capital S at that point right? in other words when he got back into his right mind right? he said I could go home I can go home what, what, a, what a revelation I can go home and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, which is what he does. And they just, real quickly, what the way that story ends is the father doesn't say anything about where he went and what he did. <laughs> and the only thing the father says is, get a cloak and put it on him, get some sandals and put them on his feet, get a uh, robe, you know, call in the musicians, kill the fatty calf. My son was lost, he's been found, he was dead, he's come back to life again. And that's the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters is that we wake up. And we will all wake up. And you know, we'll all remember home. We're all going, not the book I'm working on right now, but the book after the book I'm working on right now uh, is going to be called There's No Place Like Home. And, uh, because there's, of course, it'll be about heaven in terms of the court. We have a lot of really interesting NDE experiences out there now. And you're going to compare them with the teachings of the Course of Miracles, is what I'm going to do. It's a lot of fun to. Thing. So it's written on these two levels, and the second word that we can define is uh, the other three-letter word, which is E-G-O, and the reason we can't define E-G-O, very simply, is because there's really no such thing. It actually does not exist. It's sort of complex because we're going to spend an awful lot of time in these sessions talking about EGO like it is something that exists, but it's not, it's an illusion that has got into our minds and actually seems to kind of possess us. I mean, it seems to possess us so much that we have really uh, a lot of trouble getting free of it. But it's actually an illusion. There's just no reality to it. And that's what we have to discover, is that, that there's no truth in this thing at all. This is, Eastern philosophy has always taught this. You know, that is, Eastern philosophy, the difference between uh, Eastern philosophy and the Western, in, in the Western, we got real <coughs> in-depth psychology came along with Freud and Jung, and they, they got really into understanding the complexity of the consciousness and ego. And, and Eastern philosophy just sort of ignored that. No, let's go home. You know, let's, let's, enlightenment is the thing. Let's go for enlightenment. We're just going to head right for enlightenment. Which is what the Course does as well. It goes for enlightenment, but it helps us to understand how we got into the mess that we're in in the first place. So that we can then begin to get out of the mess. We understand why it happened. Even though, uh, <laughs> I just gave a talk at uh, ARE a few weeks ago, and some woman asked uh, the unanswerable question, which you, you almost always get, uh, the unanswerable question is, well, how did this whole thing get started in the first place? And the course is, that's not a very good question, because the question isn't how did it get started, but the real question is, why are we perpetuating? Why, why do we still do this? I mean, why do we keep the illusion alive? Why can't we break out of it? Why can't we, why can't we wake up and, and come home again? Well, we can wake up and come home again, but at least we're going to understand that. So the one unanswerable question, as I said, is, is that how did it get started? There's an answer in a way, which is uh, a myth that we're all familiar with, but the answer is a myth. And that's the story of Adam and Eve, right? It's a really good way. Let's, let's look at the story for just a, a moment. There's a guy named Adam. There never was anybody named Adam. Right? There's a myth, but it's, a, it's like understanding a dream, who has an experience. The way this experience is described in the Bible, it says, his eyes were opened and he was able to distinguish between good and 
evil. That is a very important point. So where we had a unified state of mind, we now have a split mind or a divided mind. The mind is broken between good and evil. Right? There's only unity in heaven. In heaven we have only one mind. There's only oneness. And we're going back to oneness. We're going back to wholeness. We're going back to the one mind. I was watching a show on cosmology a few weeks ago on the Science Channel, and they were talking about the Big Bang. And the word that they used to describe the Big Bang was, they called it inflation. That's what it's called. What happened was inflation, right? So the inflation is like ego inflation, right? You know, all of a sudden we go from, from nothing to this incredible, looks like something, and the way this, the, the Course described it, it says, into eternity, we're always one. There crept a tiny, mad idea. I wish the Son of God, that's you, that's me, that's all of us, remembered not to laugh. So we shouldn't laugh, this is a silly and ridiculous idea. And the silly, ridiculous idea is it's possible to be separated from God. It is not possible to be separated from God. That's the dream. The dream is that it's possible to be separate from God. But that's also a, a desperate position to be in. It's because it's a position of isolation. It's a lonely position. It's a cause of guilt and it's a cause of depression. You know, depression in, in great part is just the sense of being broken, the sense of being split, the sense of not being whole, not having a unified state of mind. So, it's interesting that for what Adam does. The first thing that Adam does when this split comes into his mind is that he runs and he hides in the bushes. Now, you could say that we're still hiding in the bushes. Except, you know, you would be, we could call them bodies. Bodies are places we hide. We're actually hanging, hiding out in bodies, you know, which, which looks like there's something real temporarily, and then we get fascinated with the body. The, the Course says the body is the ego's chosen home. So on an ego level, we are very identified with these bodies. On an ego level, we think that this is who we are, which is why we are so frightened of death. Because on an ego level, it looks like if the body goes, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> it's where you are. Well, the body's out of here. Uh, you're not out of here. Because what the Course is te teaching us is that who you are in truth, the mind, you, you can't lose your mind. You can lose your body. Where everybody, everybody loses their body. <laughs> Here's an interesting phrase I like from the Course, which says, every one already knows. Isn't that nice? Isn't that beautiful? Everyone, everyone knows what I'm talking about right now. Everyone already knows the truth. So we're really trying to just remember what we already know. We've never, ever, ever lost it. And actually, what you're doing here today is that there's a, there's a, a spark of that memory inside you that remembers it enough, and you know, by reading this book, that, that you're, you're beginning to find the, that memory. I, people who get into the Course, and I really think this is very nice, they really kind of fall in love with the Course. Uh, because they realize that it, it, the, the, the truth, is, they may not understand it, but they know it's there. You know, that's why you know, we, we have been so removed from it that it is going to take a lot. That's why you, this is a lifetime study. You know, once you start digging into this, now the good news is that the more you dig into it, the, the clearer the path becomes. The, the more you realize the, the heaven, the gate of heaven is up there, and the good news is your foot is on the path. You know, you, you, don't, you haven't realized it yet, but you, you, you're on the path. You're headed in the right direction. Okay? Actually, the, I think the Course says about it, it, I like to think of it as a diamond. There's a diamond-like quality of clarity about it. And the further you get into it, the more you'll be seeing that, that kind of diamond-like quality of clarity uh, that's actually there, and that'll help you to, to wake up. So the split is entered. So we need to try to resolve this split, and um, that's what we're going to do. So actually, let's go back to Adam and Eve, uh, because let's go back to the, the split. 
that occurs in consciousness. So in terms of the course, then, we all have split minds. Uh, so the simplest way to say that is the Course uses right mind and wrong mind. Other words we could use would be sane mind, insane mind. You know when you're in your insane mind, right? <laughs> you might even know when you're in your sane mind. That feels, feels good. <laughs> but uh, being in your insane mind feels bad. Um, Another way to talk about it, when you're in the insane mind, you're probably in guilt, has got a grip on you, and that's not a very pleasant, in fact, that's a very unpleasant experience to be in a state of guilt. And uh, when you're in your sane mind, you're actually happy, because you, it feels like you know, you're doing what's right, things, things are working for you. So the course that we have, the, we have the wrong mind, the, or the right mind and the wrong mind, and then we have one mind. And in between the two here also we have another mind, <laughs> not to be confused, which we refer to, or Ken does in particular, <clears throat> as the decision maker. So the decision maker is the thing that decides whether we're going to slip into wrong mind, and there's a thing there called temptation to really kind of get pulled into wrong-minded. This is projective, this is angry, this is attacking, this is guilty, this is poor me, woe me, kind of consciousness. Or we can, <clears throat> again, go into the, the right choices, which means I'm being kind and benevolent and loving mind. We, of course, says there's no one here in whom uh, there's no light at all. Right? The, the, at the same time, that there's no one in who, into whom the light has gone out completely. <clears throat> now, just at the same time, there's no one in whom the light has gone out completely. <clears throat> there's no one here who hasn't entered into darkness. So we bounce around between the dark and and the light, and the more we're in the dark the happier we are, and the more we can experience the, the light, the happier we are. So, as I said earlier, the Course is a, a training program. <clears throat> and one of the, it's training us how to get back in touch with the, the right mind. If we stick with the right mind long enough, it'll lead us back to the one mind. We've got to, we've got to be in our right mind long enough, consistently in the right mind, to re-attend to the one mind. And reattaching with the one mind <clears throat> is sometimes talked about in a course like what's called the Holy Instant. It, uh, in mystic, it's a pretty mystical kind of experience. When I say it's a mystical experience, what I mean by that is that it's <clears throat> an experience uh, in which you feel this, this wholeness, this connectedness, like everything is, it's, it's, it's actually perfect. It's the way that it's supposed to be. There's a concept in the Course called perfect happiness. In fact, it's the phrase perfect happiness appears 18 times in the Course. In fact, it's interesting that uh, Lesson 101 in the Course is called God's will for me is perfect happiness. <clears throat> you know when you go to school, Freshman in college, or you, you take all your courses are 101 courses, right? They're introductory courses. Well, 101, lesson 101, of course, is God's will for me is perfect happiness. We're really learning how to get back to perfect happiness, to wholeness, to completeness. To another word that we'd actually use here would be uh, enlightenment. The thing I love about the course, which just makes us indifferent than some of the more other traditional kind of Christian. Uh, theologies, is that it is, it is about enlightenment. It's about going all the way home, completely, getting out of this illusion totally, so that we don't have to keep going through this body stuff, like over and over again, the, the split mind stuff, <clears throat> to get out of the, the arrogance of the ego. I started to say earlier that, that what happens is with that split, 
when I answered that question for the, the lady in uh, Virginia Beach a few weeks ago, I said, you're not going to be happy with my answer. And the reason you're not going to be happy is because <clears throat> the one, even after I answer it, you'll say, yes, but why that? So the answer to how we got into this mess is that it all happened because of arrogance. Uh, or another word we could use would be a psychologi more psychological term is hubris. Uh, we're going to do it on our own. Thank you very much, God. That's uh, part of the prodigal son story again. Or an another word that we could use, the more theological word, would be pride. And we all know the thing about pride cometh before the fall, right? <coughs> so we enter the, the pride. And that's what happens with, with the Adam and Eve story. We have, we have the fall. We fall into the illusion. Let's go back to Adam. So Adam, first thing Adam does, after he has, runs away from God, he goes and hides in the bushes. But you can't really hide from God. Now, some of you may remember, back in the late 60s, Harry Belafonte had a popular song that was called There's No Hiding Place Down Here. It was actually an old black uh, gospel hymn that he revitalized. Calls it. Once I went out to hide my face, I brought back like no hiding place. There's no hiding place down here. There's no hiding no yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I dread to think that that's something. <laughs> There's no hiding place down here. You can't hide from God. So in the Adam and Eve story, God finds that. Right? You can't hide from God. God's going to find you. And the first thing that, that God says to Adam is, oh, why are you hiding? Adam never hid from God before. What, what, what are you hiding for? And as David and I were talking about this in the break, he said, yeah, uh, because I was naked. And the next line from God is, who told you you were naked? Where did this idea of naked? We've never been naked before. All of a sudden we got naked. How did we get naked? Now what naked means he felt shame or guilt. So it's the first experience of shame or guilt has come into the mind. See, animals don't have this. Animals do not have shame and guilt. They'll poop in front of you, right? They'll <laughs> copulate in front of you. You don't care. <laughs> no shame. You know, there's nothing to, to hide, right? But all of a sudden, there's something. And it's interesting. It has something to do with sex, because he has to hide his uh, his private parts. Right? <laughs> I got a good friend, Donna Carey, who's written a song called "Show Me Your Private Parts," <laughs> and she doesn't. She really means psychologically, you know, you know be willing to expose your <laughs> your your secret thoughts, your hidden thoughts, you know. But, uh, it, make, it makes her a funny song, show me your private parts. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> God presses Adam to, to tell him more about what happened. Let's not forget that Helen was a psychologist. She was a, actually a Freudian psychologist. So, just as Bach was an aviator and Ramanujan was a mathematician, uh, etc., or Mozart was a musician, Helen was a deaf psychologist. So that's why she got the course. Because she understood it perfectly, actually. Right? She really understood Freud all the way. Now, one of the things that Freud did was he, he explained to us what we call ego defense mechanisms. And he explained to us how ego defense mechanisms work. And of course, talks about ego defense mechanisms too. And there's really two primary defense mechanisms. And all the others kind of fall into these two. And the way it works is this. By that I mean it's either push it away or pull it in. The first tendency is to pull it in. And that is to hide it. To bury it. To not look at it. So we, we, we bury, we hide. Troy talked about this in terms of repression. The Course talks about it in terms of denial. We deny, we hide, we don't look. This is also not being honest. But the more we also bury and hide our guilt, the sicker, actually, that it, it makes us. Because it, it has this tendency to come out. And it'll eventually come out as a projection 
or it will literally make us physically sick, right? Um, so if it's really physically making us sick, then we have to look at that too. So one, the first level of defenses is to bury, hide, don't look. The course places a lot of emphasis upon being able to look at your, your, your private thoughts, your, your pitiful, actually it says, your pitiful, meaningless private thoughts. And the, of, the reason for the pitiful, meaningless private thoughts is that you think they're so important to keep that buried and to keep that hidden, and the truth of the matter is they're nothing. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't even matter. You, you ever have somebody that maybe will come to you and honestly share something that they've been kind of ashamed, or, and, and you listen to it and you go, well, big deal, I mean, what? <laughs> you know, what's that? You know, that's, that's really not, the shame was nothing. To them it was something that was buried, was really important. Right? But the two levels, one is we bury behind, the, and the other thing that we do is we project, and projection is really important. We, we, so what happens? Adam says, Eve. Eve. Actually, he blames it on God. He said, the woman you gave me. <laughs> the woman you gave me. It's his fault. Yeah, gave me this fruit, and I did eat their cup. So now we know women are responsible. And you've been paying the price ever since, right? <laughs> so then God goes to Eve and says, Eve, what happened? And Eve immediately goes to second line of defense and says, well, the serpent did beguile me, tricked me, right? And I didn't eat their mouth. And as you know, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Actually, there's uh, one of the apocryphal books that didn't get into the Bible. It's called The Gospel According to Adam and Eve. And in the Gospel according to Adam and Eve, it's not a serpent that tempts Eve. It's an angel, it's the devil rather, disguised as an angel. Did you ever meet the devil disguised as an angel? <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> I think you should go into death and buy a really fancy car. <laughs> Uh, a tempter, you know, it's a, a tempter thing, you know, it's like, snake and out, go ahead, nobody's looking, you know, you're good, you know, it'll work, and you'll get by with it, you can lie, go ahead, lie, lie, you know, who cares, you know, you're going to get what you want, aren't you? I mean, you know, we've all met that devil disguised <laughs> as an angel. After all, you're doing it for a good purpose, right? <laughs> <clears throat> I was actually surprised there was a uh, thing on television a few weeks ago about how much cheating there was going on in different universities, and the, the reason was that it was all for, you know, like just so they can, you know, ultimately, it was so they get ahead, you know, it would be okay, it would be okay in the long run, right? So that's actually, so the Course is really trying to help us to look at all the stuff that we deny, that we bury, that we repress. But also, really importantly, is we help us to become aware of how much we project. So, it's really about trying to help us to stop bearing and also to, to stop projection. If you don't stop the projection, the first step is really to see how much you project. And you're projecting everything. Chapter 21 begins, the first three words of chapter 21, very important. Projection makes perception. The world you see is what you make it. And then the next is a very important word, nothing. Nothing more than that. Well, it's not more than that, it's not less, therefore to you it's important. It's a witness to your state of mind, it's an outside picture of an inner condition. As a man thinketh, so does he perceive. That line is from Proverbs, and Jesus quotes it in the Gospels, and then it shows up a third time in the Course in Miracles. Therefore, and the next line is one of the most quoted lines in the entire Course. Therefore, seek not to change the world. Choose to change your mind about the world. Perception is the result 
and not a cause. So it's really important that I understand that. To become a good course student will become progressively aware of how much they are projecting. And we're doing it all, anytime you get angry, anytime you have an attack thought, uh, anytime you want to use the word they, they, they did this, they did that, they did that, they did that, no, all that, all right? <clears throat> there is no they. I was in uh, Atlanta and uh, the friend I was staying with asked me if I would drive him to the airport before I went to my next job. And uh, I said, well, sure, I had time to, before I went to the next city. And he wanted to get the best channel on the radio where the, the, the reports are on the highway so we could get, take and be sure that we wouldn't get caught in a traffic jam, right? So he found a, there was this commentator on the, the radio. And, and I, I will not mention Russ's name. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I kept saying, they, 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 them, 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 they, 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 them, 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 well, they're, they're, they're just, they're, there's no they, there's, there's, there's no them, they don't, they don't exist at all, there's no one to project onto, no one, so that means that even if this tiniest little thing that I see, this fault, this flaw, this problem, when we get around to studying chapter 9, section 3, you'll see that the call the correction error, I think it's one of the most difficult chapters, in the entire book because it's about helping us to retract our projections, to stop, to remove the projections. Because once you remove the projections, that's actually a mystical experience, removing the projections. Because once you remove the projections, you have this really beautiful experience of seeing things the way they really are. And the way they really are, they're actually beautiful. And everything, when, when everybody's fine in your mind, then everything is fine in your mind, and everybody's beautiful. Even under those kind of circumstances which we wouldn't necessarily think of as, as being beautiful. That's why the Course asks us to, actually, I'll read you one line from that chapter. We'll touch on this again several months from now, so I'm going to remember that. <laughs> After the bombing in Boston uh, a few weeks ago, the Sunday after I'd gone to speak at a church and I had a particular topic, and I abandoned the topic, and I changed it to the boy in the boat, which was the topic. And I asked us, how are we to see the boy in the boat? And what are you, you're laying there, you're dying, the biggest posse in the world is after you. The guilt that may be going through the mind. You've killed a child, you've killed several other people, you've maimed other people. You know, what's, how are we to view the boy in the boat? And I'm getting closer to it. Here it is. Here it is. Then, yeah, actually, I'm going to be reading, if you've got one, on page 167, uh, paragraph 5. What about oh, the, the huh? large preposition? Do you know what page it's on there? Uh, no. <laughs> but it would still be uh, uh, chapter 9, section, section 3, fifth paragraph. Right? When a brother behaves insanely, you can heal him only by perceiving the sanity in him. If you perceive his error and accept them, you are accepting yours. Now there's a real challenge for you, right? When a brother behaves insanely, we'd all agree that he behaved insanely, right? You can heal him, how do you heal him? Only, only by perceiving the sanity in him. So there's a, God, there's, a, there's a speck of sanity there somewhere, a little piece of sanity there somewhere. There's no one in whom the light has gone out completely. I was listening to a, a talk, uh, Joe Bolte Taylor, who wrote uh, Stroke of Insight, you know Joe Bolte Taylor, uh, was talking to Oprah 
not long ago, and um, she was talking about some research that she had done in which they found that if you have an insane thought, or let's say if you have a child, a child is throwing a temper tantrum, like a the terrible two temper tantrum, that if you can take that child and just hold it for 90 seconds, that's all, just 90 seconds. If you can hold them for 90 seconds, it will go away, right? So the same thing, if, if, you can, if you have a temper tantrum in your own mind, right? You can just hold that, throw some love around it for 90 seconds, it'll go away. But the tendency of the ego is going to be to know, go, go ahead, get into it. Yeah, tell them how you feel. <laughs> Which just drives you crazy. Or matter, you know, it's just, you make matter matter, and then it just makes you matter. <laughs> it just drives you more and more insane. So the idea is to stop it, you know, but, but just stop it, just, just hold it. Just to hug that little insane child inside you that's screaming, I didn't get my way, and it'll change it.